Okay, for chapter four, part two, we're going to be covering Newton's second law of motion. And we're going to look at free fall and non-free fall. Okay, so let's go look at Newton. Okay, remember Mr. Newton? And he has his lovely natural hair. Other people in those days often wore wigs. Newton never had to wear a wig because he had this gorgeous curly hair. Anyway, um, so uh, he was an amazing guy, as we talked about before, but um, he also, you know, took on responsible jobs, like he was the director of the, the Mint for England for a long time. Um, he got it whipped into shape, so printing money, that was something that he was involved in. Um, anyway, so, um, so anyway, so uh, we will see more of Mr. Newton in the future. Okay. Um, now, Newton's second law of motion is called the force law. And the acceleration of an object is directly proportional to the net force acting on an object. Now, what do we mean by directly proportional? Okay, directly proportional means that if one increases, the other increases. And so we've got the force and the acceleration. So in other words, if you increase the force, then you also increase the acceleration. Okay, so they both go up together. And usually we're talking about in a linear fashion here also for directly proportion. So if force goes twice as much, the acceleration is increased twice as much. Okay, um, so here we've got uh, someone pushing on a brick. The same force accelerates. So if you have, hold on, I'm missing one of my slides here. Here we go. Wrong slide. Okay, so here we go. The uh, force, if you pull with twice as much force, then you would expect to have twice as much acceleration. So one person pulling has one unit of acceleration, two people pulling, two units of acceleration. However, what happens with the mass? What if you have twice as much mass? Well, then the acceleration is halved. So this one person pulling two carts, now the acceleration is half as much. Okay, so, so obviously it depends on mass too. So let's go back to that slide. So acceleration of object is directly proportional to the net force. Notice that's the net force. It is in the direction of the force and it is inversely proportional to the mass of the object. So we've got an interesting situation here. We've got something that increases with force but decreases with mass. And inversely proportional is where it's one over. But inversely proportional, basically the idea is as we increase mass, the acceleration is going to go down. So inversely proportional, one up, one down. And so Newton figured out this rule that acceleration equals the net force divided by mass. And so this is the law that's talked about in your lab also, um, where you can say it in words or an equation, right? Or a data table or a graph. Okay, so anyway, so this was the law that was used as an example in there. So acceleration is net force divided by mass. Now, it's also talking about net force. So we just looked at this one force pulling that this guy is pulling with, but there might have been some friction too. And so really what we have to consider is the net force the combination of the forces that are on the object. And sometimes that gets kind of forgotten um, in the equation. So we'll talk about that in a minute. Okay, so uh, by students. <laughs> okay, so anyway, so here we've got a person pushing on a brick. 
The same force accelerates two bricks, but only half as much. Inversely proportional. Twice as many bricks, twice as much mass, half as much acceleration. And here we've got three bricks. Three times as many bricks, one third as much acceleration. So that's that inversely proportional. Okay, so one of the places where this gets, well, not forgetting, forgotten exactly by physicists, but it tends to happen that people quote this law and they forget to put net force. Um, Newton usually wrote the law like this, that acceleration is the net force divided by the mass. But often you'll hear this law quoted as F equals MA, and people just say F equals MA. They don't say F net equals MA. Um, so anyway, so yes, it is supposed to say the net force is equal to the mass times the acceleration. So you got to think about all the forces on an object before you can predict what its acceleration is going to be. So here we have a force of 10 newtons pushing on a two kilogram brick. What's the acceleration of the brick? Now, in this case, there must not be any frictional force because normally there would be. Let's say the frictional force equals zero. Okay, all right. So now we are considering all the forces on this object. And so it might be on a frictionless surface. And so our acceleration is gonna be the net force which is just 10 newtons, divided by the mass, which is two kilograms. And we would end up with an acceleration of five meters per second per second. So in other words, this block is going to gain five meters per second of speed every second. So it starts out at zero speed, but one second later, it's going to be going five. The next second after that, it's going to be going 10. Then it's going to be going 15, then 20, and so on, right? So the velocity is going to cre keep increasing, gaining five meters per second every second. And of course, you can write that as five meters per second squared. OK, so let's look at this block. So let's say that this block has two forces on it. So we've got an applied force, so someone's pushing on it. And let's make that applied force equal to 20 newtons. But then there's a frictional force. And remember, frictional forces are going to be opposite the motion. So the block is going to go to the right because I'm pushing to the right. But there is a frictional force. And let's say that frictional force is 4 newtons. OK, and let's say that the mass of this block is 8 kilograms. OK, so now we've got all the information we need to solve this. So the force of friction and the applied force. So first we have to find the net force, right? Because we're going to find the acceleration. So that's the question. What is the acceleration? OK, and so we want to use that Newton's formula. Acceleration is the net force divided by the mass. So what's our net force going to be? And I wrote sum of forces there because that's usually the way I do it. Sorry. So you can write net force or Fn. Um, OK, so what I'm going to do here is uh, what's our net force? Well, we can figure that out separately, or I can just do it right now. We know it's going to be 20 newtons minus the four newtons, right? They're in opposite directions. So the four newtons is in the negative direction. And then I'm going to divide by the mass, which is eight kilograms. OK, so now what do I got? I've got that 20 minus four is 16 newtons. That's the net force. And my mass is eight kilograms. So my acceleration is going to be 2 meters per second squared.
Okay, so anyway, so that's the way you would do what's called a difference of forces problem, where you've got more than one force you have to account for or take the difference of. Okay, and I could have, you know, three forces on here or more. Um, anyway, but right now we just have two. Okay, so anyway, so it's pretty simple to use. Now, of course, you can reverse this and ask how much force is happening. And um, so remember the other version of the equation was force equals mass times acceleration. So let's say I have this couch that I want to move. Okay, and that couch has a mass about as much as a human. So let's say it's six, oh, 60 kilograms. Okay, and I want to slide that couch across the floor. Okay, so let's see how much force I would use if it was on a frictionless surface, which actually let me demonstrate a little bit on that. So over here, let's see if I can get this to spin. Okay, so hopefully that shows up larger. So over here I have a cart that is almost frictionless. And it doesn't take much force to start it moving, right? And in fact, the force is so small that I can't even measure it with the force probes that I have here. Okay, so um, so you're going to have better lab equipment for in the lab. Um, but the force is too small for me to measure. But I can measure the force on this. This has a lot more friction and a lot more mass holding it down, right? So it makes a difference whether or not there's friction. And so I can measure this. So as I pull this, I can read the number of newtons of force on my spring scale. As I pull it, you can see the spring inside moves. And so as I pull it along, now it takes a little bit more force to start, remember, because there's static force. First, so I'm pulling and pulling and pulling, and then it starts to move. Whoops, now it's stuck in a crack. <laughs> now it's moving <laughs> along smoothly. Sorry, my setup is not perfect here. Um, so anyway, um, actually, let me um, change the setup a bit. Uh, I'll get rid of the crack. All right. And that should help a little bit. Okay. So anyway, so as I pull, then I get a fairly constant value here of five newtons of force to pull this along. Okay. Whereas if I pull the one that has no friction, though a similar mass, then what happens is that it's almost impossible for me to measure. <laughs> so I'm pulling this along, and it's like one-tenth of a newton. Okay, so friction makes a huge difference when you're thinking about the net force. So we're going to do this with no friction. So it's important in a problem to check to see if there's a frictional force or if there's no friction. Okay, so it should say, say a frictionless surface. So in this case, we're going to say it's a frictionless surface. And we want to see how much force then it takes to accelerate it. And we're going to give it an acceleration 
of three meters per second per second that couch so we're going to push on it and that's the acceleration that we desire so how much force are we going to have to use so it's pretty easy so the net force right this should always really be net that i need to use is a force of three times 60 i'm sorry other way around 60 times three let's put the 60 in first 60 kilograms times three meters per second squared. And that's going to equal 180 newtons of force. Now that's the net force. So if it was frictionless, that's how much force I would need to push with. However, this couch probably does have friction. So what I know is that I have to push harder Let's say there was actually 20 newtons of friction, then I would have to push with 200 newtons of force to achieve that 180 newtons. Okay, so the more friction there is, the harder you are going to have to push. Okay, but there's a certain amount that's required of net force for a certain acceleration. All right. Um, Okay, so let's look at some more stuff. So, um, free fall. We talked about that before, right? In the absence of air friction, all objects fall with the same acceleration g, which, yes, can vary around the surface of the planet, but we're using 10 meters per second squared. Now, the weird thing is that we also, Galileo had talked about how the mass of a falling object well, that means that there's a greater force because now we know that the weight, the weight is equal to mg. So a bigger apple is going to have a bigger force. But, uh, so the question is, you know, this is like Aristotle. He said, hey, well, if the mass is bigger, or the, you know, then it's going to have a bigger force and that means it's going to go faster. But Galileo didn't say that, right? He said all things should fall at the same acceleration. And we figured out it was g, 10 meters per second squared. Okay, so what's going on here? There's definitely more force, but there's also greater inertia, more mass. So greater force, the acceleration would go up, but greater mass, the acceleration is inversely proportional. It goes down. So what happens is they cancel out. You increase the force with a greater weight, but you also increase the mass, right? Because the acceleration is going to be the net force divided by the mass. So you can increase the net force, but if you also increase the mass, then those cancel each other out. Okay, so um, so anyway, so here's the idea. The acceleration due to gravity is always going to be g because the force is the weight, and that increases with mass. But the inertia is given by the mass, and that increases too. So when you have two masses, two bricks tied together, you've got twice as much force, but you also have twice as much mass or inertia. So you end up with G in the end. Okay, so anyway, um, so it's pretty cool. That's why things fall at the same time if you don't have to worry about another force like air friction. Okay, so as long as that's negligible, then things fall at the same time. So Newton's Law figured out why that was true. Um, but what if there is air friction? Well, that's what we call non-free fall. So when you have air friction, it opposes the motion. So down here, for some reason, is a sack of potatoes or rocks falling through space and that your author drew. And so the air friction is also called air resistance so that we don't have to use another F. So they put R. Remember that it's proportional to the velocity of the falling object. But it is, of course, always opposing the motion. So as the sack of potatoes 
falls under the influence of gravity, that force is pulling downwards. Air friction is pulling back upwards. And so you end up with, um, because you now have an opposing force, if we put it into Newton's second law, we get that the net force is going to be the weight pulling downward, right? So weight downward and minus the air resistance upwards. And the weight is always mg. So you have mg minus the air resistance. And of course, you're dividing by the mass. So this is a formula you can get for falling objects if you know what the air resistance is. It's very difficult to calculate the air resistance. So you guys won't be calculating it. You'll just be usually being given it. Um, because it depends on, remember, velocity and surface area. So it's a very difficult calculation. Okay, so let's see what happens, though. All right, so let's um, take this lady here. Let's say that she is 60 kilograms. So that's her mass. And what we're going to do is uh, the air resistance is going to be 120 newtons. So she's reached a point where her surface area and her speed are such that the air resistance is 120. Her weight, of course, is the force pulling downwards. That's going to be mg. So that's going to be 60 times 10. And so that's going to be 600 newtons. Okay, so now we've got everything we need to solve for her acceleration. And so we need the net force. The net force is going to be the weight, which is 600, minus the air resistance, which is 120. And those are newtons, of course, for both. And then we're going to divide by the mass. So you have to go back to her mass, which is 60 kilograms. Okay, so we've got 600 minus 120, which is 480. We're going to divide by 60, and we're going to get an acceleration of 8, right? 6 times 8 is 48. Okay, so anyway, um, so we've got eight watts. Well, it's eight meters per second squared because this is the um, acceleration, right? So it should end up acceleration. So whenever you have newtons divided by kilograms, you end up with the acceleration, meters per second squared. Okay, so don't worry about the units. They should come out all right as long as you have the right units of newtons and kilograms. Okay, so pretty cool, but let's see if we can take this a bit further. Um, because remember that air resistance is proportional to surface area and speed. Well, let's say this lady is speeding up, of course, as she falls. She is because she is going faster and faster and faster. So let's say that her air resistance increases. And now her air resistance is... Three hundred newtons. Okay, so she's got an increased air resistance. Okay, so how is that going to change our numbers? Six hundred minus one twenty. Nope. Now it's going to be six hundred minus three hundred, which means that our air resistance, um, having increased, now reduces the net force to only three hundred also. And what's three hundred divided by sixty? Well, that's going to be five. So her acceleration is less because there's more air friction. She's still accelerating. She's still speeding up, but she's not gaining as much speed per second. Okay, but she is going very fast because she still is gaining speed. She's not going backwards. She's not slowing down. She's just not accelerating as much 
right? So it's like when you're in the car, you're driving, you know, you zoom away from the stoplight, at, you know, at, when it's green, um, and you're pushing down on the pedal really hard. That's a strong acceleration. But then later you let your foot up a bit, right? You're still accelerating. You're still speeding up, but now there's less acceleration, okay? Less speed gained per second. And eventually, well, what do you usually do? Usually you reach a speed you want, and then you have um, a balance. Okay, so let's see if we can achieve that. Well, when does that happen here? Well, what would happen if the acceleration um, went to zero, just like it does if you take your foot off, uh, you know, you're just applying enough in the car to go at a constant speed. So what would happen if, let's change this one to a nice purple color. Okay, so let's say that this person is going so fast that their frictional resistance reaches 600 newtons. Okay, well then what happens? Now we've got 600 here. Well, what's 600 minus 600? That's going to be zero. What's zero divided by 60? Well, that's still zero. So in other words, the acceleration is now zero meters per second, per second. She's not gaining any more speed. She's not going zero speed, though. It's zero acceleration. Just like when you're in the car, and now you've got things perfectly balanced, where your forward pushing of the engine balances the air friction. That's what's happening here. And that's what we call terminal velocity. Terminal velocity is when you've got the forces balanced that there's no more acceleration. And that happens for skydivers. And so terminal doesn't mean where you die. It's your final highest speed unless something changes. So unless you pull your parachute or you change your body shape, you know, so that you dive instead of putting your arms out, that would change things. But you've achieved a balance of forces here and you're moving at a constant speed downward. Okay, so terminal velocity is reached when the force of friction equals the weight, right? So we have the force equals 600 newtons for that girl. That was her weight. The acceleration is zero, the speed becomes a constant. So now she is in dynamic equilibrium, right? Her net force is zero. And then she would fall the rest of the way to the ground at that speed, unless she pulls her parachute at some point. And even after you pull your parachute, the forces adjust again, and you end up going at terminal velocity again, the rest of the way down, but a much lower speed. Okay, so anyway, so when you throw something out of an airplane, it often achieves a terminal velocity if there's enough distance. And um, so if out of an airplane, yes, even something like a bowling ball will achieve a terminal velocity, but that's about 145 meters per second. So that's pretty fast. That would be close to 300 miles per hour. Um, a tennis ball will achieve around 60 miles per hour. And um, a ping pong ball only is going to be going about 18. A raindrop is going about 15 miles per hour. Now, that's it's good that the raindrops have, of course, terminal velocities, because um, if raindrops falling from clouds were, have no air friction, then they would be going... Um, like a thousand miles per hour as they hit you. So that would be very, very bad. So so anyway, um, so yes, so it's very good we have air friction. And in fact, raindrops is usually reach their terminal velocity in just a few feet as they fall. Okay, now um, people want to know what would happen if you throw a penny off the Empire State Building or something. Um, it would be going, or the Sears Tower, which is the Willis Tower, um, 70 miles per hour. Will that kill you? Well, usually not. Um, Mythbusters did one of these, and they shot pennies at each other at that speed, and they got 
a little blood on their hands, but um, it usually won't kill you unless, of course, you're standing under the Willis Tower and you look up and you say, oh, look, here comes a penny, and then it embeds itself in your eye and then goes into your brain. So that possibly could kill you. But otherwise, you know, don't don't look up um, and uh, it, you'll probably be okay. Okay, so anyway, um, so one last idea there is, does weight make a difference? Well, we used her mass in those calculations and it does make a difference. So let's say that this guy is 800 Newtons of weight and this person is only 500 newtons. Well, what happens is that they're both falling. And since they have their parachutes open, they're going to have about equal surface area. But what happens is the air resistance builds up. And this person, when the air resistance reaches 500 newtons, they reach terminal velocity and they start going at a constant speed. For the other guy, when his air resistance reaches 500 newtons, well, he's still pulling with 800 newtons downward. So he continues accelerating. And so he's got to go faster and faster and won't reach terminal velocity until he reaches an air friction of 800 newtons, which would have to be moving faster. So yeah, so it does make a difference in that the, the bigger person is going to reach a greater speed, a higher speed, and uh, they'll reach their terminal velocity later. So they will. So this guy will start drifting down at a constant speed. This guy is zooming by him, and saying so long. You know. So so uh, so yeah, that one will reach the ground faster. So he's not getting as much time in the air. Uh, which yeah, there used to be a couple who was in my class, and uh, they uh, the husband always reach the ground first before the wife when they would go parachuting. And that's the reason why he was heavier. So she got to spend more time in the air. Okay, so that's the end of this lecture. So I'll see you next time for chapter five. <laughs>